Oh, hello. Fancy seeing you here on a Monday morning, but glad you could join us. Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, we will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their businesses to success in an ever-competitive business climate. So pour yourself a hot cup and enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Today I have one of my friends on the show today. His name is Danny Chabano. He's an entrepreneur who took over and operated his family furniture business from 2012 to 2017, and since then has moved into providing health insurance to individuals, employers, and for businesses to own their own property and casualty premiums. In his spare time, Danny paints, attempts to sometimes play the guitar, writes for beinglibertarian.com, and roasts his own coffee. Danny, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lance. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Glad to be talking with you from Colorado. You're in Oklahoma, right? Yes, Norman, Oklahoma. Beautiful. Well, Danny, I'd like to start off today. If you could just tell us first about what it was like working for your father's businesses when growing up, at uh, which, at which at one time had up to 28 stores, you guys sold major appliances, electronics, and furniture in four different states. What was that like? Uh, well, it was certainly uh, challenging. Um, there, there was lots of benefits and uh, you know downsides as well. Um, it was great in that it gave me an education that you can't buy anywhere. In so far as I got to do pretty much everything, all aspects within a, a fairly large business. You know, and at the downside of that, you know, when you're working with family, there can be, you know, sometimes strained relationships and things. But overall, it, it was very good. Would, would you think that experience, I mean, is it obvious? It's probably maybe an obvious question to ask, but is that what led to your entrepreneurship? Or are you just kind of, is it yes. you're following yes. a lineage no, there? Yes, no doubt about it. Um, whenever my father sold his business in 2002, um, I really didn't want to stay on with the people that were buying it, wanted to do something different. So that's when I uh, opened the furniture store just because you know, I'd grown up in that and knew it uh, most of my life and uh, just sort of gravitated toward uh, rustic furniture because it was something uh, gaining in popularity at the time. Yeah. And before we get into that, I, I do want to obviously talk about you know your, your 2012 to 2017 run. Um, but back to your father, what, what are some of the best business lessons that, that you think he taught you? Um, I think more than anything else uh, is probably, one, integrity, and two, work ethic. Um, he was somebody that, my gosh, like, like a lot of guys that, that are successful in business, a little bit of a temper issue sometimes. He really lied into you, but at the same time, you know, he, he had such a golden heart and would help any of his employees just bend over backwards for him if he knew they needed help. And so there there was some of that. Um, and, you know, just as far as work ethic, there's, there's nothing quite like uh, knowing that if you just keep at it, there's usually always another answer out there somewhere about what to do next. Sure thing. Was he was he one of those type of guys who would not be easy? Um, in other words, rest easy if he was. Uh, a lot of us are workaholics, we're entrepreneurs, right? And we just. Oh, I'm, I get that way. Absolutely, yeah. He uh, worked uh, for the most part was his life. Not many hobbies, uh, mostly work. But you know, there's there, that does not to say that a person can't have good balance in their lives, but uh, that's just what he did. Mm-hmm. What What about something, is there anything he failed to teach you that maybe you learned from on your own, or even if there was a bad, it was some kind of practice you didn't like that he did that you sort of took into your furniture store? You know, from yours? Um, well, you know, that there's always things. When he closed in 2002, um, there was the Internet, but Amazon was not so much a thing. Um, neither were a lot of those uh, online outlets. And so obviously that that had to adapt. And when he sold his business, the number one form of advertising he did was newspaper. Obviously that's not going to work for anybody anymore. Um, 
in most cases anyway. And so there's those advertising things that he had a lot of difficulty understanding. This was a guy that, that had literally never touched a computer in his life, never owned a smartphone, never had no clue how to operate one. And so that was things that he had some difficulty grasping and changes in the business. And so those were some things I wanted to change. And then, you know, my personality is a little bit different. I had to always, uh, every time I brought in an employee, I'd have to just kind of give them a little spiel about, listen, I'm not that guy that's ever going to yell at you. I will never raise my voice at you. I will never get in your face. But got to warn you, a lot of people don't think they're in trouble unless they're being yelled at. So <laughs> you, you kind of have to explain that, you know, so that people can understand that I, I may not yell at you, but I do expect you to listen. So. Yeah, yeah, walk softly, carry a big stick, right, in some cases. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's move into your furniture store then. Tell us more about, about your furniture store, which, by the way, I want my brain to know, it, at one point, Danny says it was the third largest of its kind in the U.S. selling rustic style furniture. That is that is correct. Um, you know, and that I realize that sounds very impressive. Uh, in that universe, um, it's a fairly narrow uh, retail environment, and so uh, I was third largest in the country. I had a, a thirty-six thousand square foot store, and um, could order pretty much almost anything in that category had access to. So there was just thousands and thousands of items available. Um, didn't have to have a whole lot of employees to do that, but it was a really successful um, niche for a long time. And in some ways, it still is. It's just that, you know, like I mentioned earlier, environments change. And here in Oklahoma, uh, the economies heavily rely on agriculture and energy. And both of those things kind of hit a wall about uh, three years ago or four years ago. And so uh, that took a lot of uh, my customers out of the market. Yeah. How about you? So you talked a little bit about staff. Um, I've always been fascinated by salespeople. It doesn't matter if they're selling a service, if they're selling a product, um, if they're selling a variety of different things. Maybe it's a combination. Um, how did did you learn? Is that one of your strengths? And did you learn that from your dad, and then bring that into the store, and then? What, what, kind of, what was it like training employees, you know, selling furniture? Or did it just sell itself? No, no, I don't think there's really any such thing as something that sells itself. Uh, you, you really got to talk. I, I know there's a lot of salespeople out there that like to say that, but it really isn't true. Um, yes, my, my father was extremely instrumental in training on sales. In fact, that was the number one thing he trained on with everybody because, you know, without sales, you don't have a business. So um, that that was a real emphasis. And as far as training people on that, when I interviewed people, I I really didn't care that much about the resume other than I, I obviously want to know if uh, you were busted for uh, armed robbery or something like that. But outside of that, I mainly was looking for people who could communicate well and had a friendly, outgoing personality because everything else is trainable. Um, mm -hmm. and, and obviously also somebody appears to have uh, some level of uh, work ethic. And so if you get a really friendly, outgoing person, um, in in most cases, you can teach them how to sell. Break, what, what would you say a, is the... Um, Describe a typical sale for you, or even maybe maybe one of your hardest sales uh, that you have that you ever had. You know, somebody comes in the store, and I mean, are you, do you have a sense of um, if somebody comes in if they're they're really tire kicking, or versus you know they're they're they actually yes. want to spend a ton of yes. money? Yeah. Yes, um, to an extent you can tell, um, and generally, uh, well, in that particular business, uh, Oklahoma City had a whole lot of. Uh, horse shows and, and rodeos and things like that. And so there would be, um, in some sense, kind of tourists, for lack of a better term, uh, coming through the store from time to time, just checking things out. And they have no trouble telling you that. And generally, um, what uh, I would instruct staff to do is, you know, somebody says, oh, you know, I'm just in town, just kind of curious what you have, just looking, give them a little bit of space and back off. That doesn't mean ignore them, it just means, Give them some space and back off. Let them look. 
just kind of keep your corner of your eye in that area because when someone has a question, they'll kind of wave at you or just look up with a question on their face. So, um, you know, that's that's not terribly difficult to manage. Have you ever used your sales experience to, let's say you're going to shop for a car, you know, do you, there's a story that one of my employees tells us, and I thought it was brilliant a couple of weeks ago. He said, so here's the example. Is that he said, one of his professors was an architect. And when she had people come over to her house, uh, like a contractor um, or anybody who's going to do any construction work, she would not tell them she's an architect. And she could find out through that interaction with them who was being honest and who wasn't. Have you ever used your knowledge of sales when you go to buy something to help leverage a better deal? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's an accumulation of experience there having grown up in it my entire life. I have a pretty good bull crap detector <laughs> that, that <laughs> yeah. kind of comes with that. You know, I can always, or not always, but most of the time tell when someone's being a little loose when the, with the truth. Um, that just kind of comes naturally. Um, I don't generally tell them, hey, I've got a lot of sales experience or anything like that, but I do kind of know the systems that are going on, you know, car dealerships in particular, you kind of know the guy I'm talking to is not the guy that's going to make the final decision on this deal, but you got to use them to work for you. And so you use that salesperson to make the deal with the sales manager, basically. So, you know, you just kind of, you kind of know what's, what's going on with sales when you've been at it for a long time. Well, break that down for people who haven't been though. So is there any kind of, okay. just, you know, yeah. Well, generally, uh, you're going to talk to a salesperson, and if it's a, a category where there's a lot of negotiation on price, like cars, for example, then that salesperson is generally, in most cases, not going to be able to make the decision on the best price. And so uh, you want to actually use that salesperson as your own ally, tell them, hey, I want to you know, I want to help us make this deal today. Here's what I need in order for for us to make this happen. I'd really like you to have this sale. So let's work together on this. Go to your manager and tell him, I want this and this is what I'm willing to do. And uh, so most of the time, they will go back and forth to that sales manager and keep wheeling and dealing, so to speak. And so you, you almost use the salesperson as almost like an employee for you if you can work it that way. Yeah, I think it's beautiful insight. Yeah, uh, and because that's the truth of the matter, right? I mean, there's sort of this in-between, there's the yeah. one on the floor making making it happen and everything. And yeah, I like that idea of you, you, you present it as a team. Like, let's work together to make this done. Here's what I need to do. Here's what you need to do. Let's make that happen. I think that's a lot more, yeah. that seems a lot more, uh, well, just teamwork. I mean, it doesn't seem as competitive. Like, in, if any, nobody's trying to screw each other over at the end of the day, right? Um, yeah, what exactly. Are, kind of a, yeah. What, what kind of advice would you give uh, someone who would like to start a furniture store like you had? Uh, well, right now, I would advise them not to. But yeah. uh, um, if, if they wanted to, I would say um, in this environment, what is absolutely key is one, don't open a retail front. Stay away from expensive retail. Just get yourself a warehouse and go totally online. You can display a few things in your warehouse if you want to invite customers there. But I would definitely not invest in uh, expensive retail storefront space. Also, um, make sure you've got enough knowledge in business. Uh, too many people enter business thinking they, they really don't need to know that much about it. You need to have some basic understanding of, of accounting and accounting principles and uh, just overall operations of a business in general. And um, also extremely important is uh, specialization. You've got to be able to offer people something that they can't get if they buy from a large online business. Uh, so, you know, some sort of expertise, some sort of uh, high level of uh, customer service. You, you've got to do something different that uh, they can't get somewhere else. Um, and that goes kind of, you know, with a niche as well, some sort of niche that uh, others aren't adequately providing for. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, that was great. I, I think, you know, you kind of alluded to that when we first started talking today about how your dad was not tech savvy. You were you were more more tech savvy, and now sort of the next generation really it truly is on online sales. I, I think that I think that was perfect. Um, so during your time at your furniture store, you also worked as a financial advisor and stockbroker. As we record, uh, for, for, uh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, yeah, I did for a brief period. Um, I uh, jumped into that for a while, thinking it was something I maybe had wanted to. I, you know, I spent a lifetime in in retail, but that's not necessarily something I enjoyed. I know that sounds strange. It was something I knew how to do, and so I could make mm-hmm. money, and it wasn't necessarily enjoyed. So I thought, oh. I want to try something that I really know I would enjoy. And so I tried uh, being a financial advisor, working as a stockbroker. I did well with that. Um, Never had any clients lose any money. Every single client or portfolio performed exactly as expected, which is not not particularly usual. However, Mm -hmm. in that business, there was a big difference in managing money well and in getting new clients. Getting new clients for me, and I've spoken to a lot of other advisors that feel the same way. Starting out as a financial advisor these days is uh, an astronomical uphill climb, and it's one that I had decided, you know, even 15 years ago, that uh, you know it's it's not something that uh, was all cracked up to be for me, and I, I just kind of opted out of that. And so when I came back into the business a couple of years ago after closing the furniture store, I decided to go a different direction and just kind of leave the investment side behind and just focus on insurance. Yeah. Before we get into that, um, what I was what I was going to pin you down with was it's uh, it's March nineteenth, twenty twenty. The uh, the market is has corrected by now about thirty percent down. Some people are saying it might go uh-huh. forty, some it's fifty percent down. Do you see a bottom coming soon, and, and what would you be investing in right now? Well, I I definitely will be jumping in here in the near future. I kind of feel like within the next week or so, it will kind of bottom out. Um, I don't say that with 100% confidence and enthusiasm, but I think that's kind of going to be the case. Um, that's just kind of what it looks like with uh, behavior. Uh, it's it's really tricky to to pick bottoms, um, and it's really tricky to uh, predict short term investment behavior. Just because you know the the shorter the term, the less information there is out there, um, and so it, it's hard. But I kind of think that the next couple of weeks we're going to see a bottom, and I think uh, what I'm personally going to do is not so much trade stocks, but trade volatility. In other words, use stock options to uh, sell some of those really high premium uh, puts that are out there and, uh, you know, capture money as the stock market slowly climbs up or at least, the very least, levels off. Yeah, no kidding. It, it's been a wild ride these past couple of weeks for sure. And I, I would agree with you. By the way, for anybody who's listening, we, we are not liable <laughs> for your decision. Um, we're just... We're just speculating, uh, and my speculation is uh, much the same of yours, I think, over the next couple of weeks. We will see the bottom. Um, historically, the biggest crash, the biggest market correction we've ever had with the S&P 500 was 57%. So it's going to be somewhere between 30 and 50-ish percent. Um, but now on to yeah, insurance. So, yeah. Yeah. So now on to insurance. What do you um, – tell us about that new adventure after you left the store in 2017. Yeah, um, as I was looking around for what I need to do next, um, insurance is something that, uh, yeah, with the business I left in that furniture business, it was a niche. And so, you know, there there was only a limited universe of people that had an interest in that. So I thought, well, um, in, in this scenario, maybe I want to look for something that's a little more uh, recession proof. And everybody always has to have insurance, no matter what position you're in. You've got to have some kind of insurance. And so I went into that, and I noticed um, very few or relatively few agents are looking at health insurance. 
So that's one of the areas that I definitely uh, cabbaged onto. And then the other area is uh, captive insurance companies. Um, it, I'd set one up for my father, gosh, like 18, 20 years ago, something like that. And I, I knew it was something that, that not very many uh, business owners knew about. And in most cases, it's usually accessible only to very, very large businesses. And so I looked around and tried to, to find a way to bring that down to uh, a business that's more of an average type size or, or you know, smaller middle-sized company anyway. And so now, rather than, you know, premiums having to be 500000 a year, you know, four hundred thousand dollars a year, something like that. We can get that down to you know about sixty-five thousand and above. And so there's basically three areas I'm working in: individual health insurance, group health insurance for businesses, and then captive insurance companies for uh, property and casualty premiums for businesses. I still don't think most business owners know about this captive um, policy. Yeah, most captive. Yeah. Yeah, break it down for us. I mean, I think that's a beautiful thing to talk about. Yeah, and it, what you're really doing is all of the uh, property and casualty premiums you pay every year, you know, things like commercial auto, professional liability, um, some businesses sell warranties, um, some businesses uh, are do a lot of credit business, also credit insurance, uh, workers' comp, property insurance, all those kinds of things you could actually be paying those premiums to yourself. Now, a lot of businesses under what self-insurance is. This is like self-insurance, except you still get to pay the premiums. You still get to write them off as a business expense, so it reduces your tax burden, uh, just as it always has. And instead of writing those checks to an outside insurance company, you write them to an insurance company that you have. It's your insurance company. And so... You actually get to profit off of the investment income from that rather than some other insurance company profiting from that. And so it's really kind of a scenario that's just a, a no brainer if you fit the size requirements. Um, and we, we reinsure, portion of that goes to reinsurance so that you're not exposed to any more risk than you were before. How would it, how does it work then? So say for my company, a, a lot of a lot of architects, engineers, contractors have just your one million dollar policy. It'll cover something up to you know a million dollars of, of it issues. If you're writing a check for two thousand dollars a month already to somebody, are you in that category? And then how how do you how are you able to cover a million dollars you know without being this big conglomeration like um, any of the any of the big well, any of the big insurers? What we would do, let's let's say, Lance, that, that you're paying like oh five thousand a month in E and O coverage on your employees or or maybe you're paying uh you know maybe you've got a bunch of uh automobiles in your business and you're paying, you know, another you know, thirty thousand in in commercial auto expense. We would take that um uh, uh that ninety thousand dollars that you're paying out annually, instead of paying that out to another company, you pay it to your own insurance company. Now, part of that ninety thousand dollars, that may be something I don't even know. You know, it's kind of hard to guess numbers, but part of that's going to go toward reinsurance. In other words, we're going to uh, make sure that you have coverage above that ninety thousand dollars, so that you don't get wiped out with a big large claim of a million dollars or something like that. And so we're going to find a company to cover you from that level up, and that's called reinsurance. So um, if you have a claim, you make it against your insurance company, it's going to take some money out, but you're not in any worse position than you would have before. Um, and in this scenario, if you don't have any claims, well, then you're going to be able to invest uh, whatever cash is not going toward reinsurance and, and management fees and that kind of thing, you'll be able to invest that in suitable investments and get the uh, uh, income from it. That is incredibly interesting, and you really, you really perked my ears and my interest with that. So, Because I, I wonder if maybe we're a candidate for it. 
what is the minimum threshold? Is there a gross revenue? Really? Thing? Real, and this is not necessarily a real hard number, Lance, but mm -hmm. about 65000 above is a good number. If you get much below that, you start losing a lot of the advantage. You start that, that amount that you have for investment income is going to dwindle down in a hurry because there are management fees as, as well as the reinsurance. And so you, you want to have enough in there that it's doing you some good. Okay. Well, I want to break something down for them for our listeners just from my perspective so they can understand maybe as it relates to them. So we're about, right now we're about a 10-person firm, including the construction arm. And the last year we paid about that amount. You and I had a private conversation about this a couple weeks ago. We had paid about right, that amount, yeah. as, it, as it were, about 65000 I think we would have been there. And to put it in perspective for, for everybody, our gross revenue then would have been about $3.5 million. But we did a giant development. And so everybody knows this next year, we will, our, our gross sales are looking like about a million dollars. Not sure we'd, we'd be there. So for anybody who's in my industry, architecture and engineering, I think you're probably looking at, you need to be at about a 12 to 12 to 18 person firm, I think, in order for you to qualify. But those are all, you know, things you got to value for yourself. If, if anybody who's listening to any, if they want to get in touch with you to learn more about this, um, where would, where would they go? How can they get in touch with you? Um, well, I'd be happy to give out my phone number and email. That'd probably be the easiest way. I'm also okay. on LinkedIn. So, uh, phone number is 405-659-9081. Um, my email is Danny, D-A-N-N-Y, and then period. My last name is C-H-A, B as in boy, I-N-O, at gmail.com. Awesome. I'll, I'll be sure to uh, link up with you after this. I'm, like, I'm surprised we're not. Maybe right. we are. I don't know. I, yeah, I feel like we should, though. Um, and that was me kind of jumping ahead. Usually I ask that question at the end with everybody, but I think it was just perfect timing. Again, I think I think there will be some few people listening out there that this this could make sense to. I mean, it, it really makes sense to me. I hope to get that big that we could do that because it, you know, it's sort of yeah, the hand is in the way. mouth. Yeah, you're making like you're sort of making your own ecosystem, you know, and holding yourself accountable in so many different ways that way. Yeah, and, um, and Lance, there are some other businesses out there that um, maybe haven't even necessarily thought of some ways they can use this. Like um, I was told the other day of a uh, jewelry store that decided to do this, and they are selling policies to their customers that cover, like, theft and that kind of thing for, for just the jewelry pieces, which is – a good niche for a jewelry store because you can obtain those things through your homeowner's insurance, but if the jewelry is a little too expensive, a lot of them don't want to insure that. So um, that's a great thing, too, if, if uh, you're in a type of business that you can imagine selling some type of insurance product, be it a warranty, be it, in that, you know, in this case, the coverage on jewelry, any of those kinds of things works really well. And that kind of well, yeah, doesn't even require... Sorry, it doesn't require what? What was that, Danny? That that type of thing doesn't even require reinsurance because you know one claim isn't going to wipe you out. Uh, it, it's small individual claims. Yeah, you made me think about an idea as a builder. So right now we have to we we don't have to, but it's it's basically standard practice. Of you build you build a house for somebody, you you have a builder's warranty period for one one year. You cover yeah. you know any, any defects. You know, extending absolutely, yeah. is really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, uh, so last question here is, uh, I'm going to wrap this up, is uh, knowing what you know now, and if you could go back in time, what would you tell your former self before starting your first business? Um, I would go back in time and tell myself uh, – a lot of those key factors that I mentioned earlier, and I think I would probably tell myself that uh, don't put too much trust in anyone, and by trust, I mean insofar as uh, handling money and handling merchandise. <laughs> Good. <'Cause> that's... that's... <laughs> Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit more? Because I take it there was a few well, times yeah. where. 
Well, yeah, actually, uh, particularly uh, when you're running a going out of business sale like I did with my furniture store, uh, there were very few people who did not steal. So uh, oh, it was almost like a free for all, and uh, it, it it was tough. I brought in as many people as I could trust as I could, but it wasn't enough. So yeah, great advice. Well, Danny, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to share your knowledge and expertise with us. And uh, I wish you wish you all 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 the best in your in your newest endeavors. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed it, and if you did. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on the iTunes app. Tip your barista, and we'll see you next week for more Monday morning coffee with Inside the Firm.